Um, welcome, welcome to everybody here. Um, and as John uh, communicated, um, uh, we're really focused on uh, Florida's fragile waters tonight. And what we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna give a little more of an introduction to what many of you heard, have heard me mention before, which is the Indian River Lagoon. Um, and uh, you can view it in a sense as a quick case study. And then Danielle, um, who is an expert really on uh, uh, much, much more, much deeper expert than I am and on much broader range of topics. Danielle will pick it up and talk a little bit more about Florida's fragile waters. As I said, my fragile waters are the Indian River Lagoon. And um, the diagram here on the, on the left shows that the Indian River Lagoon is uh, an estuary actually, uh, not a lagoon. Um, and it spans 100 and 156 miles uh, on the order of half or so of the East Coast. Um, but it is not alone. We also connect uh, with Lake Okeechobee and the, the runoff there um, and uh, the St. John's River, um, which many of you are connected with up there in Jacksonville and also uh, groundwater and springs. And to focus in a little bit more in terms of my area of interest, I live in Brevard. And so Brevard uh, accounts for about two thirds or something like that of the Indian River Lagoon um, and you can see here on the right that there are actually um, three water bodies that make up what we call the Indian River Lagoon here. There's the Mosquito Lagoon up north, um, and, and that is by Cape Canaveral. And then there is the Indian River Lagoon, which carries on down further south, and then also the Banana River. And there are very few. Um, cuts uh, in this area. I think maybe only one and uh, down further south here around Sebastian. There are very few cuts into the Atlantic uh, Ocean. So water moves slowly here in, in this, in this uh, lagoon. Um, so let's see here. Uh, oh, okay. Whoop. Okay. Um, and so, yes. Our lagoon is fragile. And what I show here is uh, evidence of that fragility. Um, here we have a picture from 2016 during the uh, large uh, fish kill. In fact, this is what I came to when I decided to move to Florida. Um, and sadly, here is another um, more current problem uh, the manatee kills, and there have been over a thousand in the last year, and on the order of a third of them here in, um, uh, in, in Brevard. Um, and this is the culprit. Um, it is uh, algal blooms um, that are caused by nutrients. Um, that it affects human health, environmental health, property values. That's a big concern in a practical and regulatory way. Tourism, again, a big concern from that economic point of view. Um, but really going ahead and uh, dealing with this fragility um, is the right thing to do. And so what's, what's the cause here? What's causing it? Well, um, the answer is that, uh, and this becomes a really challenging thing, um, when, as I'm doing now, trying to build a, um, uh, an advocacy team, um, what causes it, and, and somebody said this earlier, it is uh, the nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen in the water. And it is phosphorus and nitrogen that stimulate the growth of algae blooms. Algal blooms uh, cloud the water. They block the sunlight, which in turn shades the seagrass, so the seagrass dies. It depletes the oxygen in the water, so you get suffocation of the animals, 
leading to the fish kills and other things. And then all of that matter, whether it's uh, algae or dead fish, goes to the bottom and decays, and it begins the process of releasing more nutrients back into the water column. So this becomes um, a cycle. The sources of these excess nutrients are wastewater, um, uh, stormwater runoff, which is a major, and you can see here, stormwater counting in, in our area for about 26% 20 of the nitrogen, uh, excess nitrogen. Base flow, which is groundwater essentially. Atmospheric deposition, and so that's an interesting point that atmospheric deposition also, um, you know, uh, just natural or from car emissions, et cetera. Um, and then muck flux. And muck flux brings us back up to this bottom uh, coating of the decaying matter because muck goes ahead and decays in an anaerobic way, releasing that, um, uh, that, that nitrogen and phosphorus. So that's the cycle that, that causes what we saw back up here. So let's go forward. And there is good news here, not a, not a full answer, but good news. And that is in 2016, the citizens uh, in Brevard voted more than 60% in every precinct to go ahead and establish a half cent sales tax, uh, the money for which goes into <clears throat> into a fund that is directed only for projects to restore the lagoon. It's a 10-year program and uh, it addresses nutrient sources. So they're on the order of 300 projects of various different types uh, dealing with um, wastewater facility upgrade to, um, uh, to tertiary treatment, uh, advanced treatment, um, uh, various stormwater prevention systems, uh, the extraction, the dredging of muck out of the, uh, out of the lagoons, so, um, and education and restrictions on fertilizer, septic tanks. Since the program began, we also became aware that leaking sewer laterals are a significant contributor. Package plants, which are small kind of um, uh, uh, treatment plants for, for um, things like um, uh, trailer parks and reuse water are also uh, contributors. And so they're on the list. Um, so what has got to be done? Well, the half, the, the sales tax is generating a lot of money. And one nice thing is that because it's a sales tax, it also applies to sales um, you know, for tourists. So the tourists are helping to pay for the restoration of the lagoon. It's going to bring in almost $500 million over the 10 year period. But the cleanup costs are really more on the order of one and a half to $2 billion. So it makes a dent, but it's not a full solution. Um, and so there is a need to continue and expand these restoration efforts. Uh, new projects, uh, different, uh, uh, different activities, uh, but also to manage new population growth and development. There were several hundred um, uh, septic tanks that have been converted to wastewater um, uh, treatment um, here in the last couple of years. I think it's on the order of 400 here in Brevard, but at the same time, um, the county um, allowed the, the installation of something like 800 uh, new septic tanks. So that's a, an example of where the new population continues to drive that, you know, that paving, uh, that, um, you know, um, uh, continued uh, uh, um, release of, of uh, nutrients uh, and development. So we also need better understanding um, better regulations and better enforcement. And so, as I've said, one of the things that I'm doing right now is building a citizen advocate force 
here in Brevard that we're going to call um, we're going to call Lagoon Voices, um, and they will um, hopefully um, really um, uh, create pressure on our leaders to continue uh, the development and cleanup of the lagoon. I'll say one more thing, and then I'll hand it over to um, Danielle. And that is that I will get out to you um, our little flyer uh, that is what you can do yourself. Danielle, uh, I invite you to, to generalize this a little bit. Thank you, Lou. That's really great to set the stage for exactly what I'm going to share with you all tonight. Okay, so I've spent 20 years working on the shorelines of Florida, and I'm excited to bring you some of the statewide perspectives that I'm active in in my uh, practice. And it's really on the context of waterfront resiliency. And in Florida, we have a lot of waterfronts. So let me advance here. The subject today is very tied to water quality, and I want to make sure everyone understands the connection between what we do on land and the water quality that we're seeing in our nearshore areas, such as the Indian River Lagoon and other coastal waterways, the St. John's River, the Intracoastal, the Biscayne Bay, the list goes on and on. Um, so really we're dealing with stormwater runoff as one of the main culprits. Lou showed you on one of his slides also uh, groundwater contributions too, uh, but just focusing on stormwater runoff for the, for the minute. You know, when we think of stormwater runoff, it's everything that's washing off of our roofs, our driveways, our streets, our construction sites. You know, think about the, the um, silt screens and silt screen fabric that you see preventing erosion from construction sites. Well, when that unstabilized, um, you know, basically dirt soil gets onto the streets, it gets picked up in the stormwater, combined with all of the greases and oils from the streets and the vehicles using them, combined with all of the herbicides and pesticides and, and fertilizers that we put on our green spaces. And it all makes its way into the storm drain inlets and out through the outfalls. Well, eventually everything flows downstream to our waterways. Um, and the smaller waterways, our tidal creeks and tributaries end up depositing out into more of our coastal bay areas. So everything we do on the land affects the water quality in our near shore areas. So those outfalls that you saw on the previous screen here, these storm drain outlets, also called outfalls, there's been a lot of attention put on them in recent years. If you look on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see some chambers that have been created in the line of the outfall that helps screen out trash or create a vortex to drop out sediment or somehow aerate the, the water so that um, aerobic bacteria can help chew up and use some of the contaminants and it doesn't make its way into our waterway. So we're seeing a lot of attention spent on adapting storm drain outfalls in the state of Florida. In the upper right hand, uh, upper right hand portion of your slide, you can see the white box that has multiple chambers in it. This would be dropped in the line of the outfall and as water came in, bringing leaf litter and sediment, it would be captured by the cage and dropped out into the chambers so that when the water finally leaves the outfall to whatever the receiving water body left uh, that it is going to, it would be left with fewer contaminants in it. So these are as seen as measures of improving the water quality coming out of storm drains. Um, well, outfalls more recently have been uh, the subject of a lot of adaptation, not just from a water quality standpoint, but from the standpoint of preventing backflow from our waterways that are tidally influenced that could go up into the storm drain. So the video that you're seeing is a storm drain that's flowing out storm water, but there's a trap on it so that when the tide rises, it does not allow tidal water to backflow into the outfall. And that would cause uh, flooding on your streets that would be considered for example, sunny day flooding, where your extreme high tides backflow into the outfall. 
Now in the model, the little video that you're seeing, even at high tide, the storm drain has been adapted to still allow storm water to flow out while preventing bay water flowing in. And this is a way to prevent flooding. So while water quality is a big topic of the discussion, we have to keep in mind that the water quality is being influenced by the water leaving the land and that water is affecting our near shore environments. It's being deposited by our storms. Our storms are becoming more extreme um, in terms of the amount of precipitation that they're dropping. Um, and the more precipitation that lands on the, the, that falls onto the land ends up flowing and carrying even more contaminants into our nearshore ecosystems. So these nearshore ecosystems include the seagrasses that Lou already mentioned, and seagrasses are the main food of manatee. So when you have seagrass die-offs, which have been happening at an alarming rate over the past decade in the state of Florida, even more than the past decade, you then create a risk to the health of other populations that depend on those seagrasses. In more recent years, in the past five, seven years or so, we've been seeing an alarming reaction of our coral reef system. A lot of people don't realize in Florida that we have the South Atlantic Coral Reef Track that goes across Martin County all the way down to the Keys in Monroe County. And because of the poor water quality coming off of our land and other um, contributing factors such as leaking sewage pipe, um, we're seeing the onset of disease in our coral reef track. And our coral reefs end up um, dying off, having disease, bleaching issues, and, and other disease-related events. The disease that we've been seeing in recent years started offshore of one county and has just spread. Now these disease and these algae blooms and other um, responses, ecological responses that we're seeing to water quality impacts um, are exacerbated by climate change. I already mentioned the extreme storms, but also extreme heat. And all of those combine to create a perfect storm for longer algae blooms in our waterways because the waters are nice and warm, a great environment for algae to grow. The more algae we have, the more impacts to seagrasses and impacts to coral reef we see in our state. Um, so in 19, uh, 2019, uh, we started hearing a lot across the state of Florida about the need to improve our seawalls to try and prevent flooding from um, storms in particular. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, the, the storm defenses that we have. And seawalls are really seen as a big storm defense. So back in 2019, a study was done by a group of experts that saw that Florida would be the number one state in the US that would be hardest hit in terms of flood protection needs. And those flood protections were primarily seen to be seawalls. Um, you can see the top five counties, number one, the Keys, Monroe County, um, and then so on and so forth, Taylor, Franklin, Lee, some, uh, all of those are Panhandle counties, Collier being, uh, you know, obviously the, the Gulf Coast, uh, Central, uh, West Coast of Florida. Um, and uh, seawalls are very expensive. A lot of the costs are borne by individual property owners, but there's also a lot of public property and public infrastructure protected by seawalls. And those costs are gonna be borne by local and state governments. Now, seawalls are not a panacea, though, because our geology um, is so porous with our limestone that even though you may be, um, you know, building a seawall that's protective against storm surge going over the seawall or through the seawall, it's not going to stop the tidal influence going under the seawall through our porous geology and contributing to elevated groundwater as well. We're already seeing this in parts of Southeast Florida where we're having saltwater intrusion into drinking water wells and it's because of our porous geology. Uh, but really focusing on that land water interface, well, what else can we do if a seawall is not gonna be the only way to protect our uplands uh, from flooding, from, from extreme storms and storm surge, you know, what else can we do? 
Well, we're starting to see some alarming studies come out from, for example, the Army Corps of Engineers. And if you just focus on the top two graphics, you can see a proposed flood wall that is very high, just offshore and very imposing, disconnecting people from the environment. So while it may provide the, the engineering or gray infrastructure that would protect the built environment, this is Miami, uh, the city of Miami that's shown here, uh, these seawalls are not going to um, really work with societal needs and, and ecological needs of our waterfronts. So on the bottom, you can see an alternative proposal that Miami-Dade County and the city of Miami put forward for the Army Corps to consider. And that's not looking at seawalls as the only answer, but instead also looking at what nature-based features that can give co-benefits protecting against flooding and storm surge, while also adding that habitat aspect. The habitat aspect helps clean up our waterways, and I'll explain more why later, um, but also that public access and that public benefit of being able to view the water body. Uh, there's a number of studies that talk about the reduction in stress in our communities when they're able to view water. Uh, and then that ties into increased productivity. There's lots of reasons why we want to make sure people can still view the water and, um, you know, different natural systems, excuse me, natural systems as well. So we're starting to see a lot of innovation in terms of how do we make our seawalls um, have more co-benefits. And oftentimes that comes down to how can we add a living component to a seawall? So on the left-hand side, you see different texturing and patterns and creating these little micro niche environments where different crustaceans can inhabit the wall, create safe refuges for um, small fish as they're uh, growing into larger fish. A lot of these seawalls are put in our back bay areas, which are often estuaries. On the right hand side of the slide, you can see a texturing that simulates uh, mangrove roots. And these mangrove roots promote the attachment and growth of things such as mangrove oysters. Oysters are really important water filter. Um, and so the more oysters you have in your nearshore environment, the cleaner the water is going to be because of how much they filter out nutrients, that nitrogen and phosphorus. There's a lot of space for innovation on our gray engineered, really straight walled concrete type of seawalls to add more ecosystem benefits. And the more ecosystem you, or the more um, habitat you add to our waterfronts, the cleaner the water ends up being. So in the past, we really lived on the gray end of the spectrum in the state of Florida with a lot of bulkheads and revetments made of, of stone or rubble. And in more recent years, we're trying to shift our philosophy as a water state over to more living shorelines because of those co-benefits that also um, improve water quality. Living shorelines are a big part of that. Um, depending upon the wave energy of your water body, you may need to include some level of hardened features like a breakwater or a revetment to protect the plants, but the plants are a key element here and adding more of those plants back to our waterfronts will be um, in the best interest of the long term sustainability of our near shore habitat. Um, so in the state of Florida living shorelines are still amazingly considered in their infancy I first worked on a living shoreline 15 years ago in the Jacksonville area. 10 years ago I can remember trying to get the Jacksonville zoo to implement a living shoreline instead of putting a seawall in. And I think groundbreaking on that project is only going to happen this year, so even though they sound easy put plants in it's hard to get buy in, uh, but we are starting to see. Uh, patterns across the state emerge. Now, some of those patterns can be seen on this graphic where you have a lot of panhandle living shoreline projects. Um, and a lot of those shorelines are a lot lower energy. So Southeast Florida, where you have really high energy shorelines that are very erosive, you see fewer living shorelines. In fact, I'm permitting one of the very first living shorelines 
in the city of Miami on the Miami River right now, and it's been two years in design and permitting. Um, the concept of a living shoreline you can see in this in this photograph, where first stormwater coming off the land would filter through plants, storm surge and high tide would coming from the water onto the land would be intercepted by your uh, your riprap revetment. If you can see the little white tubes, those are baby mangrove trees that have been planted and eventually will grow up and provide even more habitat and storm protection for the, uh, the upland environment. The water quality gets improved because your plants are going to be sucking up that nitrogen and phosphorus from the stormwater runoff before it gets to the waterway. It's going to be trapping soil particles that are suspended in the stormwater so that it prevents them from getting to the waterway and clouding up your nearshore habitat, which can shade out your seagrasses. Um, and oysters are a big part of that as well, but oysters are not appropriate everywhere in the state. You have to pick what works well for your water body in terms of what will grow there. In addition to seawalls and living shorelines, we're also seeing um, different projects in the state of Florida start to embrace the water instead of hold the water at bay. We see this most in public settings, so public waterfront spaces. There's one, uh, I've got two examples on the screen. On the left hand side, you can see the bay in Sarasota County. This is where the Van Wet in purple, the Van Wetzel Performing Arts Center is located today and is going to be subjected to quite a bit of flooding. Already is subjected to some tidal flooding from sea level rise. Um, and will continue to get worse. So they're proposing to relocate, uh, Sarasota County is proposing to relocate the uh, Performing Arts Building and create this tiered green space that is considered floodable space. So the flooding will allow, be allowed to go onto the property. You'll have salt tolerant grasses there that can tolerate the salinity and it creates this floodable space without negatively affecting infrastructure or the built environment. On the right hand side of the page, you see the Miami River. This is the Jose Marti Park, which is serving a disadvantaged community, East Little Havana, um, just on the other side of the street that you see on the top of the page. And in this area, if you see the photograph, the river, you can see the, the gray bulkhead that's there and all the flooded space on the landward side of the bulkhead under the overpass. Well, if you look under the overpass in the proposed plan and you see all of that green space, all of that is proposed to be floodable salt marsh. So instead of building a higher wall here, we're saying, okay, allow the flood water to come onto the park space under the overpass, allow the salt marsh to grow there, it'll be planted there. And then there's a little bit more landward of a barrier. So that's in a way, um, managed retreat on a one park example, uh, where the flood wall would be on the landward side of that green space there. Um, in addition, we're seeing, ooh, excuse me, we're seeing quite a bit of innovation in how to clean up the algae blooms that result from the water quality. Um, impacts that are coming from the land. So AECOM is an engineering company and they have developed this, it's been, I think the patent is pending right now, but they've developed this way of using this intake pipe to suck up the, um, the enriched water, near shore water that has the algae bloom in it. And then it goes through a series of chambers in this container. Um, on the upper right hand side, you can see the top of the chamber where all the sludge is collecting. Well, that sludge is actually the algae bloom. And the way it's getting to the top is by all of these nano bubbles, these really itty bitty bubbles, um, basically aerating the water in the chamber and lifting it to the surface. And then the surface gets skimmed. And then there's an outflow pipe that takes the clarified water back to the water body. So you can see in the hand of the practitioner, really dark water in this bottle. And then by the time it gets to the end of the algae harvester, it's very clean and clear and returning back to the water body. 
Now, this is great to have all this innovation, but I call it a Band-Aid because it's still not stopping what's happening, which is the contaminants being put on our land, that, wat that the stormwater washing those contaminants off the land into our waterways and creating this, um, this perfect storm of enriched water that's also warmer because of climate change, storms dumping even more water to wash even more of these contaminants off the land um, and, and create these algae blooms. So I would offer to the group that we do have a lot of work to do on the way we manage our land. And that's not just pointing to our local government saying you need to implement this seawall elevation policy or you need to implement this fertilizer ban during wet months type of policy, but it's also looking at the way we vegetate our own property, the way we use fertilizers. You know, do we make sure that we, you know, not leave trash in the back of our pickup truck that as we're driving down the street becomes litter that goes into our storm drains and so on and so forth. So there's lots of little things that we can be doing to help. Um, but you know, there's, there's in the meanwhile, there's quite a bit of effort being done around the state to try and improve the long-term outlook, outlook as well as um, treat the symptoms that we're seeing in our waterways as well. So with that, um, I look forward to our Q&A session. So um, yeah, if, uh... If people want to put up their hand, you know, um, there's, uh, what is it? Uh, where do we put up our hands? <laughs> you can do it the old fashioned way, just raise your hand. There, I think that's, at I think, the bottom, there's I a, think that a works real well. That says reactions, and you can raise your hand like that, and then it stays raised. Yeah, yeah. So, so go for it. Uh, David, do you have a, a question? Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I have a lot of, you know, I've been in Florida for since when, like 40 years and, uh, you know, picked up various things along the way, uh, most of it dealing with the aquifer, but, um, I'm just wondering, there are certain industries that uh, contribute greatly to this uh, pollution, uh, sugar being one of them. And I'm just wondering if we're making any progress in the state uh, in getting those folks to be more environmentally friendly. I'll, I'll give you my two cents and, and invite uh, um, other other comments, but my sense is not really. That's kind of what <laughs> and, I figured. And as evidence of that, I'll say that one of the uh, so the uh, Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition, we have just this year, uh, just very recently, um, started uh, promoting um, to all of our uh, you know our members and uh, uh, signups. Um, recommendations on the state bills. And one of the state bills that we're recommending against passage is um, that there is a proposal that uh, agriculture can go ahead and exceed their recommended amounts of different kinds of fertilizer um, based on some consultation. So essentially it's pulling away uh, even the limited restrictions on fertilizer by ag. And, you know, so we're against it. Um, I don't see how that helps us. Lake O, I think we know is contaminated primarily um, by, uh, you know, farming, uh, largely sugar farming uh, around the lake. And it, it accumulates the, um, you know, the algae blooms which come both into the Eastern uh, Atlantic uh, and Indian River and out to the West in the, in the Gulf and stimulates, um, you know, algae blooms there. So, you know, there might be some steps, but not much. Uh, Danielle, do you have any thoughts? Uh, 
I would just say I agree with you wholeheartedly. We're not making any headway in that direction. Agriculture is regulated by FDACs, which is the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, which is our Ag Commissioner's um, agency. That's Nikki Freed. And right. she has been very um, unsuccessful in trying to implement stronger best management practices. Um, she has a lot of opposition from the conservatives. Um, and the agriculture lobby is very, very strong. It's not just sugar, it's agriculture in general, sugar being mm -hmm. a big component, but citrus is a big component as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, no, we've got best management practices and they're not really enforceable and we're doing a terrible job. Um, I, now, Uncle John told me to keep my answers succinct, so I won't expand more, but I could. <laughs> <laughs> So, so others or David, did you have a? I, a I have more questions, but I, I don't want to give someone else a chance. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Um, I put a note in the chat, Danielle, about toxic legacy, and I don't want to take the energy off the conversation, but it just seems to me that that the environmental engineers, the biologists, are ignoring the fact that glyphosate is is a antibiotic to start with. It's a chelating agent. It's also a weed killer, but it does that by taking minerals out and it also invades proteins and removes one of the amino acids in the proteins that affects our immune system, our glucocorticoids. And they now think that one of the major causes of the death of the coral reefs is all the glyphosate in the ocean. So I didn't hear much about that, but that's a, a huge issue. I agree. It is a huge issue, and it goes um, also to the uh, amount of food allergies we're seeing as well. Glyphosate is our modern evil, um, and it is, I think, on its way to being regulated in future years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a number of steps that would have to happen at the federal level for that, but there's, we're starting to see um, studies now that are more directly linking glyphosate with the negative effects, both in human health and in our um, ecological health of our, um, of our you know, habitats. So yeah, it's, it's a terrible thing. Do not use Roundup. <laughs> I don't. Avoid it to the greatest extent possible. Yeah. I, I have a, I have a question. Let me let me just follow up on. Um, so uh, I know that here um, we're we're beginning to see studies, and I think uh, I think it's uh, I'm not sure it's one of the universities uh, just announced a study that's funded to look at glyphosates um, not just in seagrass but in uh, the manatees and, um, you know, the dolphins and so on and so forth. And so, you know, we've been focused really pretty much on, on the, the seagrass. But yeah, I think we're beginning to see that the glyphosates may actually play an important role in, in, that, in that whole process. So it's an important thing. Um, yeah, so Paul, were, were you asking a question? Yeah, yeah, I have a question, and it's it's it. I, I'm familiar with the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Uh, recent, you know, amendments that are passed to conserve a whole bunch of land to combine private, uh, you know, farms, ranches with state-owned lands, county-owned lands to basically create a corridor up Florida um, for for wildlife like you know Florida black bears and Florida panthers to to freely move and to help all the other animals as well. Uh, and they've been majorly successful with um, promoting the conservation of ranches um, and other farms to, you know, basically be, con you know, conserved. Um, but I think that the, the issue is that a lot of these same ranches are the ones that are also the ones spilling the biosolids and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the pollutants into our waterways. And I just want to know, um, is there a way to, you know, get get these, uh, you know, what, what this successful campaign, which is the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and and how they've included all these huge ranches and all that, like how can we get these ranches to follow these BMPs? 
Daniel, have you, I, I, I have a comment, but it's a minor comment. Well, so I, I work less with land-based uh, systems, such as what you're referring to, Paul, but I am familiar with the effort. Um, and you know, my, I'm a water person and my practice has been in, in water in the state of Florida for the past 20 years, water resource management. So those ranches, some of those ranches, uh, especially if they're upstream of the Everglades, so just north of the Everglades, are um, part of the effort of trying to capture storm water on the ranch to allow it to sit there and settle out, clean up a little bit before it gets released to the Everglades. So I know that you know some of the ranches have been amenable to creating, they're called stormwater management areas on their large land holdings. Um, and that is a benefit uh, for water quality in the Everglades. How much of that is being pursued outside of the Everglades, Everglades initiatives, I'm, I'm not as, you know, as up on, but um, there, the BMPs are part of the problem because best management practices are rarely enforceable. So unless BMPs are going to be enforced and be part of the regulatory framework of you know, a, a regulatory <clears throat> permit that the state issues for these ranches, it's hard to get BMPs um, just, you know, willingly agreed to and, in, and um, wholeheartedly held to when it's on your honor. So there's very little reporting for um, locations that are subject to BMPs, agricultural areas, ranches um, differently, you know, ranches, the regulatory hook of how you're gonna regulate them isn't as clear. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's a problem. Yeah, and, and I, I echo that, um, the, our system for, um, in theory, uh, managing and, and setting standards um, for uh, area sources uh, through, um, you know, through uh, maximum allowable uh, limits and BMPs is, it's a shell game. I mean, it, it, it is not enforceable. That's a fundamental problem. Um, and I think it's, it's very complex. You know, I'm just beginning to dig into it and understand it. And I think, you know, it's probably, um, you know, it's probably set up intentionally to be that confusing. Um, I can talk about a concrete thing, which is that here in Brevard um, and, and maybe beyond Brevard actually, um, people get a lot of their drinking water uh, from Lake Washington. And um, Lake Washington um, ha has, uh, last year or two years ago, started having um, algal blooms. And um, some of that was really the result of what we talked about very quickly here, uh, biosolids disposal. And for those of you who don't know, biosolids is what comes out of the end of um, a second, uh, secondary treatment wastewater facility. So it is somewhat clean poop. And um, particularly South Florida um, was producing so much a number of years ago and still does that it couldn't dispose of its own quote, biosolids, poop. <laughs> so they passed an ordinance or maybe it was a state law that had that um, that poop shipped up here. And so a lot of it was dumped and is being dumped in central Florida. And it's then the water percolates through from the rain and it washes the nutrients, the pollutants into the lakes like Lake Washington, where we get our water. So, you know, the problems are fragile waters are really fragile and, and you know, they are what we, in many parts, came here for, right? We came here because we wanted the weather, we wanted the water. And, and it is what supports a lot of our tourism. People come here for the weather and the water. And what we're doing is we're tearing our fragile waters apart. Uncle John? 
Yeah, uh, when we first moved here almost six years ago, there was a lot of talk in Jacksonville about dredging the, the river, the St. John's River, to allow much bigger tanker ships to come in. <clears throat> I haven't heard a lot about it, that, a lot of that being discussed in the last couple of years, but it seems to me a bad idea if, if the river is deeper as it enters into the ocean and we have uh, sea level rise and storm surge, what would that do if the water from the ocean can get way down river in, in Jacksonville and beyond? Yeah, I can take that. Um, so I was involved in that project quite a bit. Uh, and the reason why you haven't heard about it much in the past couple of years is because all of the challenges to the permit which authorize it have been dropped. And so the project is moving forward now at this point. Mm. But the St. John's River is a pretty unique system in the state of Florida. It flows north. It's the one of the longest estuaries in terms of a north flowing river. It's about 300 plus miles long and half of those miles on the northern half are all estuarine. Um, and the input is in the Mayport area. So there's essentially a tidal wedge um, so a wedge of tidal water, salty water is heavier than fresh water. So the wedge flows along the bottom of the channel into the St. John's River. And there's some mixing between the salt and the fresh. That's how you get the estuary, right? Well, in the St. John's River, um, the location where you'll see seagrasses that like lower salinity water and seagrasses that like higher salinity water may shift over time because when you dredge the waterway, the salt wedge moves further into the river from the ocean. So you're going to transition where you see certain seagrass communities and you'll also transition where you see our uh, forested floodplains in the St. John's River, not just uh, Duval County, but St. John's County and Clay County as well. You know, you'd see um, a lot of the forested floodplains adjacent to the St. John's River are able to tolerate a small amount of salinity, but not a lot. So as you change the salinity profile by dredging that waterway deeper, you may have some of those forested floodplains dying from too much salinity and then newer forested floodplains growing up further south on the river. So you'll see this really slow imperceptible change or shift to both the seagrass and the forested flood floodplain community and it's all tied to where your salinity wedge is located on the waterway. Thank you, Danielle. Is, is that replacement uh, making it as good at ho holding the environment together? Uh, is it okay? <laughs> well, so it turns out it is okay, although the nonprofits in this arena, such as the Riverkeeper and whatnot, would not agree to that. But what the court had to do in order to obtain its state and federal permits for the work is that they had to model the shift in the ecosystem in terms of what does that mean from an impact because all impacts need to be mitigated. Well, the state, um, in fact, it was the Army Corps that required the analysis also look at what type of salinity impacts could be expected from sea level rise. So they had to compare the project impacts against sea level rise projections. The project is going forward into the future and will be you know, maintained in the future, likely in perpetuity. So what does it mean then if we have this salinity shift from the project, is it gonna be more than the salinity shift we would expect to see if you project out sea level rise or is it gonna be less? Or are you even gonna be able to tell? And what the biological model showed was that the impact of sea level rise is far exceeding any impact that you could perceive from the dredge of the channel. Wow. And who mitigates for sea level rise? In the state of Florida, we don't wanna do much in that arena. Well. We can adapt to it by living to wetter environments and stormier environments and hotter extreme heat environments. Those are the three main impacts 
from climate change that we'll see here, sea level rise, extreme heat and, and um, storm patterns. Um, but we in the state of Florida anyway, when it comes to our legislature, we don't want to talk about mitigating sea level rise, which would mean that you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions because sea level rise is driven by climate change. Climate change is driven by greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the Florida legislature, while last year in particular and this year they're following suit, they're throwing millions and now billions at adapting to sea level rise. They're passing legislation that goes in the exact opposite direction in terms of regulating greenhouse gas emissions. Steve? Well, yeah, my questions really had to do with the politics of all this and, and how to move out of the politics or the feelings of despair, particularly in dealing with looking at the legislatures and not just here, but at so many uh, legislatures captive, but in uh, industrial interests and the like. And, um, you know, and, and when the phrase, well, we moved here for the X, Y, Z, let's be honest. Uh, so the verb is moved here, uh, which means development. And from the so many county boards and and others are controlled by developers and the more the merrier whether that's 800 more septic tanks as uh we heard earlier you know you take 400 away you add 800. so it's political and um we have so much political despair right now those of us who care about the earth um maybe you guys both you know uh, Lou and Daniel can identify some successes and maybe the half half percent sales tax campaign was one or others um, in the political arena that, uh, that that can overcome the developers and their allies resistance because of course they're going to destroy the very thing that the tax base Steve's is built down. on but you know that, that yeah. there seems to be a disconnect but um so I'm, I'm i'm learning a lot but i'm also feeling more and more despair so um you know i don't want to leave here just despairing so because <laughs> sometimes knowledge sometimes knowledge you know we, we we forget we keep thinking well you give people facts and more knowledge but i think we've learned in the last decade that knowledge doesn't generate uh, necessarily the response you want as emotions and and fear it seems to be a greater driving force so i'll stop there words of hope political strategies <laughs> i i'd love to jump in first if i could lou um so i feel very hopeful actually because i see more movement in the state of florida because of individuals pressing their local governments local governments changing their local regulations and then that being pushed up to the state so it's the local governments the cities and the counties that are forcing the state to recognize things like sea level rise now we're not making much way on the mitigation aspect of it but two years ago we were hardly even addressing sea level rise adaptation so there's been a really large shift i worked for the florida department of environmental protection twice most recently under the Scott administration, which was uh, focused on deregulation and don't say sea level rise and don't say climate change. Yeah. Um, so the shift between that Scott administration, his first one, not his second, and then now to DeSantis is that we're as a state and as our you know legislature is looking at bills, we're moving towards adapting to sea level rise because of the local governments and in particular, the four or five counties in Southeast Florida, Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact started about 11 years ago. And in the past 11 years has been able to move the state now because of the pressure from the grassroots level up to get the state to now start putting money towards septic to sewer conversions and, and other types of um, nature-based solutions on our shorelines. Uh, the amount of money that's coming from the state is just um, it's astronomical. I mean, this past year, it was not quite a billion. This next year, it's proposed to be a billion. And the, the preponderance of projects have some nature-based feature to them, some level of co-benefits where you're getting protection and water quality improvement, like flood protection and water quality improvement. So really trying to get, um, you know, what I consider the triple bottom line being, you know, flood and erosion protection, water quality improvements in habitat, and public access. 
you know, it's really important that the public stays connected to the things that we're trying to protect and clean up. So I see a lot of, you know, a, a lot of hope based on what our individual voices can make our local governments do and the local governments can push up to the state. That's not to say that there aren't a lot of state preemption bills that are trying to strip power away from local governments. So, you know, there's always pressures. Well, and, and that's, I, I, I do not pretend to have the same level of knowledge uh, that Danielle does. But yeah, I was going to point out that um, we have seen, uh, you know, state preemption in, in so many areas. And there are uh, a, a few bills that are poised, you know, for action. And again, Daniel may know more about it than I do. But um, so, yeah, there is local, uh, local activity. And, and I guess you know, I kind of shut my eyes or I don't look at the gloom cloud and, you know, I go out and promote the lagoon voice formation. Right. So, and, and I mean, we can point, and I, I don't take credit for this at all because I wasn't here when it was formed, but, um, you know, I, I can say, look, Brevard actually bit the bullet and got a lot of money put up and that money is, is matched by, local or state funds on the individual projects. So there's some improvement and I think we'll see improvement in the water quality. I think we may be seeing a tiny bit of it, but we'll see more as the next few years roll by. So yeah, a little bit of optimism, but uh, I'm with you, I'm with you. I see an awful lot of negativity. So yay, Danielle, be right. Um, <laughs> That's all, uh, you gotta keep it all right? in perspective, right? <laughs> Greg, go ahead. Um, I was on the Palm Beach County Land Use uh, Board of Directors about 25 years ago, and we fought and fought and fought to get lands set aside. But the thing that was the most disappointing was our sewage treatment. And we do deep well injections. And what, from my understanding, they treat it to gray water and then inject it 2,500 or some distance under the ground that comes up out in the ocean. Is that still going on? Deep well injection is very active in the state of Florida, particularly in areas that are highly urbanized and there's not a lot of space for, for holding and treating your stormwater. Um, it, I know that some of my Southeast Florida clients, they can only rely on deep well injection. And our aquifer, I think, maybe Greg or someone mentioned that they, they focus on the aquifer. Well, our aquifer is not all freshwater, right? It's only freshwater on the top layers. And as you go deeper into the aquifer, it becomes more and more salty, if you will. So the deep well injection is meant to inject it into the portion of the, of the aquifer that we don't get our, our drinking water from. So it's not a perfect situation. We don't do a good enough job with, um, with alternatives to using water and water conservation measures and, um, and other ways of, of treating water. But there are some areas that just, they don't have any option. You know, I, I represent um, the village of Ball Harbor down in Miami-Dade County, which is surrounded on three sides by water. You've got the you know, Baker's Hall over Inlet to the north, you've got the Atlantic coast to the east, and you've got the intercoastal waterway in the Back Bay area to the west. They have, and they're totally built out, every single parcel, except for a few oh, yeah. vacant parcels that are waiting for the next building. So they, that's the only way they can handle their um, stormwater. So I think that underground injection wells are going to be um, uh, kind of the norm in our, especially in our highly urbanized areas um, in the state of Florida. Okay. And, and I'll also mention that the reason why um, our legislature is finally putting money towards things like recommendations from the Blue Green Algae Task Force to clean up our waterways and, and other um, sea level rise adaptation initiatives is because they're seeing their bottom line. You know, the, we, we, our state runs on tourism dollars, on sales tax income. So if you start messing around with the quality of our beaches, 
the quality of our more inland back bay waterways, that negatively affects tourism dollars. That means the state has less money to play with as they're developing their budget. Now the budget this year is all fat and rich because of all the money that the state is willingly accepting from the Biden administration, although they won't tell you that. So, you know, we don't, we're starting to see, you know, fewer initiatives from the Blue Green Algae Task Force actually get traction this year because the governor can fund whatever he wants right now. Um, but, you know, there's, if you're affecting tourism, you're going to affect the state's ability to fund what the state does, and that gets the legislature's attention. So now I'll actually bring in um, a maybe an optimistic note. <laughs> How's that for <laughs> a shocker? Um, so we've said um, there is no alternative uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the gray water or the uh, effluent from the wastewater treatment facilities, but in fact that's not true. And um, uh, Gates um, helped to fund, and now there is a company, and there may be more than one at this point. There's a company, Cedron, that um, really takes the solid waste. Um, from the um, uh, from the wastewater uh, facilities and and burns it, uh, generating drinkable um, water and um, uh, uh, fertilizer that can be used. You know, not by dumping it next to the not to the um, uh, to the pond, but where it's needed. And there is an effort, and I know Debbie Mayfield, our senator here, has been active in this, um, to try to get a demonstration plant um, uh, of the Cedron facility um, here in Brevard. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But there, there are, are alternatives, and these plants are up and running outside of the US. Maybe there's some in the US. So there's a point of optimism. Uh, Paul? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Um, Jim? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. A positive note, just from a time perspective, I started at OMB and federal EPA in the 70s after the water, Federal Water Pollution Act and then the Superfund Act and Clean Air Act. And everything was just a bloody battle, everything, every step of the way. So, you know, I've seen a lot progress and then backslide, progress and backslide. So I'd like to nominate Danielle Irwin for the Joan of Arc Award. <laughs> <laughs> the large silver steed with a large helmet and a, and a big sword and go get him, girl. <laughs> one project at a time <laughs> one piece of legislation at a time <laughs> yes your energy and enthusiasm and innovative perception spirit yada yada um yeah i i did all that stuff for 25 years and i'm just so glad to see the energy you're pushing go for it thank you and and lou uh you won't qualify for joan of arc but uh, we'll we'll figure out what award you get <laughs> A beer is sufficient. <laughs> all right, all right. Paul, you know, that's my I'm encouraging sorry. remark. Okay, Paul. Hey, uh, I'm not sure if this is the trending positivity uh, that we're going towards, but uh, I'm just uh, I have a question about adaptation because it was brought up a few times about you know a lot of people are interested in the in in the state legislature about trying to go towards adaptation and if if we could just like get a brief description of each region of florida like northeast southeast southwest and just like can we talk about just briefly like what will the what will those areas look like in 10 20 years mm. uh i i've used the uh, noaa's sea level riser map and done the most extreme case which is like 10 feet in the next 100 years uh, of sea level rise and i know cape canaveral is gone in our area, May Merritt Island is gone in our area in, in the in Brevard County. Uh, I know also know Tampa Bay severely impacted. I know Miami severely impacted, uh, as well as most of Southwest Florida. So I, I just wonder what these new um, 
initiatives are going to look like and how they're going to change any of that, you know, especially in each region. Let, let me ask a question here, a follow on from that. Uh, Danielle, do you know the, the model that he's talking about? Oh, I do. Yeah, it's a, it's a would very it, easy would it to be, use. Let me cut you off. Would it be worth pulling it up on the screen right now and showing the rest of this? Sure. I mean, this is interesting. I'm not aware of it. Um, and, and maybe then once she has it up, she can give some insights. <laughs> I'm now working as her agent. <laughs> Joan of Arc's agent. <laughs> Still won't get you a new helmet, Lou. Good, good. <laughs> no, I mean that's uh, that's that's a great it's a great question, and it's a great way to kind of wrap it up. I think. Uh, what are the different regions, and what what are, what are they looking at? You know, in terms of the future, is is this doable, uh, Danielle? Yeah, I, I have it up right now. Okay, then just share your yeah. desktop. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So are you seeing my screen? Yes. And the map? Yes. Okay, so this is the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer, uh, and it's pretty easy to use. It gives you an understanding of, um, you know, we'll, we'll focus on the state of Florida, but it gives you an understanding of what, you know, one foot of sea level rise might mm. look like two feet of sea level rise. Let's just zoom in to say, we have a bunch of people from Melbourne. So let's zoom into the Melbourne area. And um, we'll zoom in a little bit closer there. So you can see a couple of creeks that come in on the east side. Um, here's Melbourne and, and you know just off of the Indian River, some of these creeks that come off. So this is what two foot of sea level rise could look like. Um, we're tracking in the state of Florida about a foot and a half of sea level rise by 2040. Um, more than that, if you go further beyond, and these are projections from the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. Um, three feet, and it probably, this I think is one of the best ways to view the issue of back bay flooding. You know, people think sea level rise is focused on the, the Atlantic coast or the Gulf Coast, but it's actually when you move off of the barrier island, so here is the Atlantic and the coast, and then here's your barrier island, all this in the back is back bay area. It's where you have uh, usually lower income properties that would not be on the barrier island, your disadvantaged communities, especially as you go inland to the floodplains of some of these tributaries. So if you just look at this one tributary, Turkey Creek, um, if you go from two foot to, to three foot of, oh, it didn't register, hang on. Ah, it's not reacting. Um, it may be just a little slow here on my internet connection, but most of the flooding is actually going to be into. All right, there you go. There you go. So yeah. you see how all that flooding was off of the waterway and into your, you know, these residential areas. Uh, low lying spaces are going to be inundated often from groundwater tables rising mm -hmm. higher or from. Um, you know, the connection between one side of the waterway through a culvert over to the other. So you might have more upstream flooding. This is three foot of rise. This is two foot of rise so that you can kind of see, you know, what's going wow. on. Wow. Um, yeah, this is the Turkey Creek Sanctuary. So there's a lot of floodable space in there. That's good. You know, we want to see local governments trying to take vulnerable areas out of development pressure. So there are great programs that FEMA has for acquiring repetitively flooded properties. And if enough of those properties are acquired, say on one street, you can create you know, a, a green space, a park for the neighborhood that becomes floodable space. Now there's a downside to that because as you take property out of development, that affects the tax base for the local government. So everything has a reaction. So there, you know, there's 
there needs to be new models set up as to how local governments can deal with floodable areas and areas prone to inundation and take them out of development pressure while not negatively impacting their tax base that they use to fund what the local government does. So, you know, there's always kind of this give and take and this tug of war that happens. Um, but I'll put this link uh, into it's the digital coastal tool page, but you can get there right from this link and click get started. So I'll put this link into the chat. Terrific, terrific. Um, do, do you want, uh, I mean, this is very, very helpful. Um, do you want to pull it back up again and go to the, you know, to the state map and give a few words about what Paul was asking? Because Paul, sure. you were really saying what's happening in the different parts of the state, right? Yeah, on that uh, website, and, and maybe there's, it's just better for everyone to do it themselves. There's actually like areas of focus and they have special focus areas like Cape Canaveral or, uh, you know, uh, Charlotte Harbor or, you know, these areas, Tampa Bay, you can see them there on her desktop. They're highlighted in the blue, in the teal. Uh -huh. um, Believe and those will show you the really you know areas of focus uh, that I that are likely to be uh, most impacted by sea level rise and, and Cape Canaveral yeah. is a good one for us because uh, you know it's a it's a tourist destination for a lot of wildlife enthusiasts and uh, nature uh, you know uh, minded people and it it's pretty um, it it's mind boggling like when you see what a few feet of water would do to these areas yeah yeah. Yeah, well, and I can give just a couple of general comments too about how different parts of the state are being affected or are handling this. Um, and, you know, you have rural areas and urban areas. So the approach for the two are often different. Um, in North Florida, whether it's Northeast Florida or the Panhandle, you generally see less interest by those local governments to. Um, put forward aggressive projects and policies. Um, it tends to be, you know, those aggressive policies and, and projects tend to be focused more on um, epicenters like Southeast Florida, Tampa Bay area, maybe even St. Augustine. St. Augustine has been, uh, you know, definitely pushing the needle in Northeast Florida. Um, and then in, you know, the way you would adapt natural areas is by trying to allow space for the ecosystem to migrate landward. So if you have, you know, mangrove areas and salt marsh areas um, abutting development, you might try and phase out the abutting development to allow space for in the future, the ecosystem to migrate landward as sea level rises. Um, you're not, I mean, what states, what areas of the state are gonna be affected? Every single coastal county is gonna be affected. And if you look for, far enough out into the future, like 2100, you know, you've got two oases of um, areas in the state of Florida, one being the Gainesville area and the other being the Tallahassee area, which are some of the state's highest elevations. You know, let's do something dramatic and bring sea level rise up you know, eight feet or so, and every single coastal county is going to be affected. Um, you know, go, let's see, even further, 10 foot, you know, Tallahassee and Gainesville, Ocala areas may see increased population from migration away from <laughs> floodable areas that are really prone to tidal flooding and storm surge in particular. Um, we're already starting to see some uh, climate change driven relocation patterns in the state of Florida where people are sick of their property flooding and they're going to move to an area that's higher and drier. So some of our more landlocked areas may start as they're planning, um, you know, whether it's comprehensive planning through their comp plan or on a development by development basis, they may start looking at population trends that show more people migrating to their communities. Um, I know that's something that we've raised in Tallahassee because a lot of the areas that are flooding south of Tallahassee are um, not the wealthiest of counties. 
you know, some of them would be technically identified as impoverished counties. And so a lot of those people are going to be moving out of the floodplain into the rural areas of Leon County around Tallahassee, because the rural areas are still going to have low enough property value that they can afford to move, but they're going to be moving away from the hassle of all that flooding. Um, so, you know, different parts of the state are handling it different ways. Does that answer your question, Paul? Yeah, and I understand, you know, we're probably getting close to the time. And I, I think that does right. answer my question. We're all kind of in the same boat. So, yeah, yeah. It that way. Well, I think it was an excellent kind of capstone for, you know, for our conversation tonight. Um, so I want to thank everybody and I want to give you all um, a challenge. And the challenge is very simple. And that is that I invite everybody here to go ahead and identify in your local community an organization that is working to help Florida's fragile waters. Just find it and then send me the link to that organization. 